Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, in our Beef Brunch Educational Series webinar. My name is Ashley Edwards, and I'm an Assistant Extension Agent and Coordinator for Animal Science Programs for the LSU Ag Center. Our speakers today are Mr. Lee Falk, who's an agent and our Coordinator of Beef Cattle Programming in the Northwest region, and Jason Holmes, who's a Livestock Specialist in the Northeast region. They will be discussing best management practices in forage harvesting, as I know many of you are probably already getting baleage up and getting prepared for hay season. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We are going to be muting all microphones. We ask you please keep them muted throughout the webinar. If you're joining us online through the Teams app or link, please enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. If you're calling in and listening to this on your phone, you may text your questions to me at 512-818-5476. Again, if you're calling in, you can text questions to me at 512-818-5476. In the interest of time, we are going to wait to answer any questions until the end of the presentation. With that, uh, Lee and Jason, thank you both for taking the time to be with us this morning. Lee, you should be able to unmute your microphone and start whenever you're ready. Well, good morning, Ashley. Good morning, uh, everyone. We're uh, certainly glad to be here and talking to you all today on the uh, topic of best management practices in hay production. And when you think about it, uh, best management practices in hay production covers a wide swath of, of, of areas. And any one of these areas we could really focus on and we could do an hour or two hours even on on certain topics that we're going to uh, speak about today. But uh, we kind of uh, narrowed it down to some areas that we really wanted to focus on based on the interest of, of Jason and I. And so I'm going to dive right into it uh, with a uh, hard question first. If I can get this uh, screen to advance. There we go. So tough questions first. Is the way you're making or procuring the hay you need for your cattle herd the most economically sound method? And that's a question for you as a producer. Now I know that uh, when we talk about hay production, there's a lot of history built in there. A lot of us grew up baling hay with our fathers and grandfathers and our family. It was kind of a family effort. Everybody, uh, everybody put forth to get the hay put up. And um, it, th so there's a lot of uh, a lot of history there and a lot of uh, things to consider when you're talking about that. So but we really need to to winnow that down to uh, just a, the, the, the business practices of it. And is it the most economically sound the way that you're currently doing it? And just as a reminder, what works for your neighbors or your buddy's outfit? It may not work for yours. We, we all have these small subtle differences in our operations that can really make a big difference in the outcome. But the question at its most narrow point is, is baling our own hay versus hiring a custom baler uh, as good as buying our own hay? And so that's what I'm gonna address in my portion uh, in the next few minutes. So we're going to talk about some advantages and disadvantages of each system. And I know that uh, a lot of you, if you're watching this, you probably already know this. You probably uh, already uh, uh, attuned to, to some of these advantages and disadvantages. But I am going to go forth just a little bit and just keep in mind your own operation, how it fits in with yours. Advantages based on your own, hey, you've got control. Uh, you control when the fertilizer goes out. You control when the weeds are, con uh, are, are sprayed. You control uh, what forages you're baling. And aside from the weather, which can be a big determination in your hay uh, baling operations, uh, you can, do, uh, to a certain degree, decide how much hay you produce, uh, increasing fertilization, trying to get some extra cuttings, so on and so forth. Uh, you have quality control advantages when baling your own hay. You know the quality of hay that you have. Uh, how much weeds are out in the field. Uh, if you do, pull a quality analysis, do a hay test, then you know uh, what you've got. And importantly, what condition it was when it's baled. Did you get some rain on it? Was it really rank over mature hay? Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you make better use of your existing equipment. You know, for a cattle operation in Louisiana, you pretty well have to have a tractor. 
and most operations usually have two tractors and so you can better utilize those tractor or, or tractors you have in your operation as well as being a potential income source you're bailing your own hay you have a really good year you produce some excess hay and you can sell that to others or you can choose to custom bail for neighbors uh, maybe get into a situation where you can generate some income off that equipment disadvantages is the cost of the specialized equipment because while i said most cattle operations in louisiana have one or maybe two tractors those tractors may not be big enough to power some of that hay equipment that uh, that you need to run uh, you may have to invest in a bigger tractor you may have to uh, you, you will have to invest in some form of a cutter uh, uh, depending on your operation you may need a tether I, I maintain that it's very difficult to produce hay in Louisiana without having a hay tether uh, of some form or fashion uh, you have to have a rake and of course you have to have a baler uh, another disadvantage of baling your own hay is you're setting pastures aside for haying you know some of us have hay fields that are not fenced or leased fields that you can't graze but a lot a lot of us have pastures that we just have to set aside to to produce enough hay so that's acres that we aren't using grazing our own cattle and that could be put forth uh to graze cattle if we weren't saving them for hay increased expenses y'all know what diesel fuel is doing is through the roof fertilizer is the same thing net wrap twine parts if you've been in the hay business any uh any amount of time you know that uh, parts and repair can be a huge uh portion uh of your expenses when it comes to making hay and of course labor and time we can't discount that because making hay takes time it takes time to get out there and cut that hay and and to tet it up and, and rake it and bale it and of course hauling and all that must be provided by somebody either by hired labor or by you or if you can coax a family member into it that's even better i guess so we're going to uh, talk about hiring it done now advantages uh, to getting a custom baler is reduced need for equipment you can get by with a with a lower horsepower tractor potentially only one tractor for your operation uh, you would just need one that's big enough essentially to handle your hay and defeat it. Uh, time savings. You think about the time spent doing all those tasks related to baling hay, that can be devoted to other tasks. You know, you talk to folks and they, they'll tell you, you know, well, I, I was busy in the hay field and I didn't get around to this. Or, you know, I was going to work these cattle, but man, we were tied up in the hay field. So it, it, you can realize time savings by bringing in a custom baler disadvantages is limited quality control you still have some control on uh, fertilization on, on those hay fields you've got some control on uh, on um, weeds and, and weed control in those hay fields but you're, you're kind of at the custom baler's mercy when as to when the hay's cut when it's baled conditions uh, all, all those things that's a big complaint I, I get amongst a lot of folks is Oh, I, I can't get somebody in to cut my hay. Uh, I lost a cutting because of it, so on and so forth. So you have limited quality control and it can become expensive. You know, you get a custom baler in there baling your hay for you. Uh, they, they've got to be paid and that money's got to come from somewhere. And, it, and most balers want it pretty quick after the after the equipment leaves the field. So you can rack up some expenses. You have to be prepared for that expense. And finally, buying the hay, you know, advantages of buying hay is greatly reduced equipment costs just kind of like hiring a custom baler you can get by with only the bare minimum of equipment the the just big enough tractor to perform the other tasks on your operation such as spraying or fertilizing or, or uh, bush hogging clipping pastures whatnot you can see a huge savings in time by buying uh, that time can be devoted uh, to those other tasks on the farm and maximizing grazing acres <clears throat> this is unique to buying your hay you can open up some of that hay ground that you usually pasture you usually devote to hay production to grazing get it in your rotation as far as uh, your grazing system disadvantages when we're talking about buying your hay is little to no quality control uh, you know a lot of hay that's bought some of it is sampled and a, a quality analysis is run but most of the time it's after the fact so there's a lot of trust issues there uh, with the person uh, person you're purchasing hay from. Uh, so another thing unknown when it when it comes to buying hay, 
is uh, what the condition was when bailed. Did it get a rain on it? Uh, you won't know how many weeds are in there until you bust open a bale and get to feeding it or unroll a bale. Availability. Uh, you know, we all know that plenty of rain, there's plenty of hay for sale. Everybody comes out to woodwork selling hay. In drought, the supplies are limited or high prices. Uh, I put in there, I think 2011, everybody remembers that drought pretty much in the northern, uh, northern, northwestern part of the state whenever hay was so scarce and we had folks from Texas coming over to Louisiana and even, even farther into the southeast uh, buying hay drove the prices up to astronomical levels. Uh, just keep in mind that for the, you know, we do have good years, but we also run into droughts and, and that's going to affect hay availability and cost. You know, depending on the amount of hay you need, that can be a substantial part of your uh, expenses throughout the year is hay if you're buying every bale that's being fed. So uh, when, when we put together this uh, presentation, I've, I've talked with Jason and we kind of uh, uh, talked about maybe putting together a scenario. So uh just to kind of compare and contrast some costs and so for this scenario and i, I just want to point out that uh, you know some of these numbers we're going to be talking about they may be different for your operation but we had to generalize some numbers and kind of get some averages on some stuff and i used some uh research to to put together these numbers and so on and so forth so for this little scenario we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a hundred head cow herd this this cow herd is fall calving, meaning the cow is born anywhere from uh, September to uh, maybe early November. And we're going to assume that the hay is being fed from November the 1st through March 15th, which is 135 days. Now, I know what a lot of y'all are thinking, you know, you thinking, well, I go to December 1 without feeding hay or I feed hay all the way up to April 1. So your, your results may vary on the number of days, but we felt like that was a good working average. Now, uh, each cow is lactating because they're fall calving, and so a lot of been, a lot of work's been done on how much hay uh, per day uh, a lactating cow consumes, and 30 is a good number, and that's the number we're going to go with based off the research data that's available. So our total hay needed for our 100 cow herd would be 405,000 pounds, and we're going to assume that we're be, we'll be feeding round bales. I know that there are some folks in the state very few nowadays that still feed conventional squares and there's some in the state that are feeding large squares but for the most part in louisiana we're feeding round bales and for the purposes of this little scenario we're going to be talking about 900 pound round bales that'd be four by fives and we're going to also assume that they have been stored in a barn so we've got limited loss in quality and quantity so we do the math there and it comes out to be 450 bales uh, needed for this herd uh, for the year. And I, I know we didn't factor in the amount of hay your bulls eat, any, any calves or yearlings you're weaning and keeping, you know, your saddle horses, what, what have you. We're just focused on these cows uh, for this. So scenario one is buying our hay. This is fairly simple. We uh, know we need 500 rolls of hay to get us through the winter. Uh, we're going to assume we're buying those good quality four by five foot round bales and that is costing us $45 per bale by the time we get it in our barn. Now, when we talk about hay prices, this can be a very fluid number. I know there's a lot of you probably listening to this say, oh, I can buy my hay for $25 a bale or I can buy it for 30 or, you know, I pay $50 a bale or what have you. Um, but, but generally speaking, when you talk about $45 a bale, by the time you get it in your barn, you haul it, get in your barn, feel like that's a pretty good average. And, and once again, we're wanting to, we, I want to put the focus on good quality hay there, not the bargain basement stuff. Total hay cost would wind up to be $20,250 to get us through the winter on, on that scenario. Now we're going to go into the baling your own hay. And there are a number of assumptions we got to be made when we're doing this calculation. And I, I want to mention that the, the, the equipment figures that you're that I'm going to be talking about are based on the 2019 LSU Ag Center tractor and implement cost calculator. This is a, a, a worksheet that's developed and maintained by Dr. Kirk Guidry, and it's a very handy tool to figure up these costs. And I do want to uh, want to point out before I dive into this that these costs are not uh, including the initial purchase price of this equipment. This is the cost to maintain and run, uh, including labor, 
uh, this equipment that I'm going to be talking about real quick. So for this scenario, we're talking about having one 60 to 89 horsepower cab tractor, which is fairly typical to run the round baler we're using in this scenario. Uh, we also have a 40 to 59 horsepower open station tractor. Uh, think of the tractor that would be used for raking or tedding purposes and also a, 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 a disc mower, a hay mower, a four basket hay tedder, a double wheel rake, ground driven, and a four foot by five foot round baler uh, capable of baling a 900 pound bale, dry bale. I want to point that out. We're not, Jason's going to be talking about balage briefly here in just a minute, but on this uh, example, we're just talking dry hay. We're not going to get into any balage. Uh, we're going to assume that we've got a 75 acre hay field uh, capable of producing three cuttings of hay throughout the growing season. And I know that in a good year, there's a lot of folks here that get four, maybe five cuttings of hay. And uh, that there's some that in this state that don't get but two cuttings of hay. So uh, three cuttings, a good average, just in an average year, that's one we're going to go with. Going to assume that this field produces two bales per acre per cutting, uh, which a lot of you may average uh, quite a bit more per, uh, uh, per uh, cutting as far as yield goes. But for this example, we're going to just figure on two bales per acre per cutting. So our total hay produced, there we go. We're back to that 450 round bales is what we would need. Now for the fertilizer, there, there's a, 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 a hundred different ways we can figure this. And I'm sure that there's some people that are listening that are going to uh, maybe agree or disagree with what we did here, but uh, assumed uh, just the cost of ammonium nitrate. That, that the nitrogen source is all that we put in on fertilizing. And Jason's going to talk in depth here in just a minute. Uh, about fertilizing and fertilizer needs and how much nitrogen is pulled off of, of land whenever uh, you, you take hay off of it and everything like that. But uh, without dig, digging too deep in this, what it comes out to be is $58 per acre. So uh, our total fertilizer cost would be $13,050 per field per year in fertilizer. So the cost to run this equipment mentioned before, including labor and fuel, would be $26.02 per acre. Our total cost for equipment would be $5,854.50 for the year. Now, if you've been in the hay business for any amount of time, you know that you're one clutch job or one overhaul away from that number ballooning into $10,000 you know, uh, $10, or adding another $15,000 now uh, for a complete motor job or so on and so forth. But for this uh, purposes, uh, cost, co cost comes up to be $18,904.50. Our final scenario is hiring that custom baiter, getting somebody to come in and, and bale our hay for cut rate, uh, maybe in Ted and, and bale our hay. So we're going to keep the same assumptions from our last scenario, that 75 acre field, three cuttings a year, getting two bales, uh, per acre per cutting, total yield being 450 bales. And we're also going to keep our fertilizer assumptions that it's going to be $13,050 per field per year in fertilizer. So in this scenario, once again, we're hiring a custom baler. We're going to assume that we pay $25 per bale for them to do this service for us. Now, I know there's a, there are people across the state that cut, rake, and bale hay for $18 a bale. I know that there are some that may do it from north of $25 per bale. But just keep in mind that in this 25 per bale uh, cost, we are including uh, cost to get it in the barn. You know, a lot of times a custom baler will come in and they'll cut, rake, and roll your hay, but they're not going to touch it afterwards. They're on to the next field. So you know, if you are paying $20 uh, per bale for a custom baler to come in and do these services for you, uh, if you add in your cost uh, to get that hay in the barn or if you pay them to do it, we're probably pretty close to that $25 range. Total cost to hire this custom baler, including the fertilizer we used, would be $24,300. So to summarize kind of what we've been talking about here, in, in our first scenario, buying our hay, we'd be looking at $20,250. Uh, if we bailed our own, using our own equipment that we already had, uh, assuming we didn't, um, didn't buy any hay equipment that year, uh, $18,904 in the final scenario would be hiring that custom baler to come in would be $24,300. Now, I want you to keep in mind a couple of things. When you're talking about buying your hay, that figure could be 
uh, 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 very higher, uh, could be uh, quite a bit more if uh, if we're in a drought or if uh, if hay is kind of hard to come by. And uh, you know, you buy bargain basement hay, and that's what you get. You're not providing your cows. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, you're not meeting their needs, so to speak, and you would have to meet it with feed or uh, some other kind of supplement. Um, when we're talking about bailing our own hay, it costs $18,904. Well, uh, let's assume that our rakes had it. You know, every piece of machinery we got has got a usable life, and you know that life is going to come to an end at some point where the repairs are more than what uh, than what we can stand, what the equipment's worth, and we have to replace it. Uh, and if you priced any of this equipment lately, yeah, there's quite a bit of sticker shock there. That number could be greatly uh, increased uh, depending on how you figure in on, on your uh, financial accounting for it. And uh, of course, hiring a custom baler is twenty four three twenty four thousand three hundred dollars. Uh, Sometimes uh, there's a lot of good custom balers out there in this in this state, and there are a lot of people that do it right. But there are some that don't, and, and that's just a uh, fact of life. And you have, once again, going back to our uh, advantages and disadvantages, there are uh, some quality control issues you may be dealing with on a custom baler. I've talked to many producers who have lost a, 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 a cut in the hay in the fall. And the fall is the time of year when this uh, tends to happen, whenever uh, days are getting shorter and we start getting some moisture and the custom baler's busy, can't get to it, can't get to it, rain uh, coming and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you've lost a cut in the hay. Or if you get it, it's just salvage value as far as uh, quality goes. So my question to you is, and that's a theme throughout my whole uh, talk that I, I, I've been given so far, is to evaluate what works best in your operation. Sit down, keep track of your costs, evaluate how you are, are procuring your hay, how you're either bailing it or buying it or, or what have you, and, and try to remove that historical uh, uh, standpoint from, from your uh, decision making, I guess you would say. Uh, don't just bail hay just because your uh, grandfather did and because you grew up doing it and you, wanted your, you want your kids to have that experience. Don't let that be the deciding factor. When we're talking about the beef business, uh, being in the cattle business in Louisiana or anywhere in the country to, for that matter, uh, it, it's a business decision and we got to treat it like that. So that, that, that's my, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, stance to you, my, my task to you is to evaluate those things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this segment of it by saying that uh, I deal with a lot of producers and it is exceedingly hard for a hundred cow or less herd to justify uh, bailing your own hay. I'm not trying to talk you out of it, please don't misunderstand me, but there's a lot of reasons to buy, uh, bail your own hay if you're a smaller operation, but it's very hard to make it pencil out versus buying hay in a lot of instances. So I just want you to evaluate that and, 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 uh, and, and look at that from a financial standpoint in your operation. Uh, final thing I'm going to talk about real quick before we get to the main show, as Jason, uh, is a word about summer annuals. And when we're talking about summer warm season annuals, we're talking about things such as sorghum Sudan grass or pearl millet, and there's a lot of others out there um, that can be planted uh, uh, in, in these uh, warmer months in our summer growing season and that we can use for hay production. So here at the Hill Farm Research Station in Homer for the last two years, we've been uh, conducting an extension demonstration project uh, focused on sorghum Sudan grass and pearl millet. Um, so um, we still good, Ashley? I got to. Oh. Oh, maybe I did mess it up. I told Jason to share. I thought it would cue it. Go ahead and share your screen again. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's, that, that's okay. We'll get this team's thing figured out. Huh? Yeah, it, 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 it's just, I'm about done. <laughs> I promise. I thought it wouldn't go live till I told it to. Okay, you should be good now. Okay. So, so briefly, what I was talking about is our... Uh, our summer uh, warm season annual demo here at the Hill Farm Extension Demonstration. 
And basically what we did is we took a field. This field has, uh, it is traditionally in ryegrass production during the, the fall, winter, and of course spring. Uh, as part of a grazing demonstration we're doing using some winter annuals. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that here other than just briefly mention that for uh, so you'll know what state this field's in. Basically, it's in ryegrass and, and whenever we get done grazing it, we pull these cattle off usually in May and uh, and get it cut in, in late May, early June. We remove that uh, existing ryegrass, that ryegrass that's uh, uh, on that field, we get it removed. Uh, and then we come in and we drill these uh, these annuals. So in the, we have three plots in the same field, sorghum Sudan grass, pearl millet, and then we have a control. The control is primarily comprised of common Bermuda and crabgrass. It's just kind of whatever comes up out there uh, is the control. So we, we drill, uh, using no-till drill, we come in with the sorghum Sudan and the pearl millet in June. Uh, plots are fertilized with two tons of broiler litter per acre. Reason we use broiler litter is it's what we have available here at the Hill Farm. We have a, a, a poultry division here, I guess you would say, and, and we so we've got access to the litter. Uh, we harvest the forage, uh, we round bale it, and we individually wrap it. Uh, we put it up for baleage. Uh, and if you, uh, Jason's going to mention baleage later, but basically it's a high moisture hay. I'm sure he's going to talk about it more here in just a little while. We uh, got two cuttings this last year in 2020, one in July and the final in late August. And these are the cumulative results from last year from our uh, 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 demonstration using these forages. Sorghum Sudan grass, we, we got four, uh, 40,709 pounds. When you take the moisture off of it, it came out to be 2.81 tons of dry matter per acre. Our cost for that uh, per ton of dry matter was $67.14. And average crude protein, as far as quality goes, 12.7. Average TDN was 51.8. RFQ average was 93 and a half. Pearl millet, we did a little less on the yield, 36,892. But whenever you took the moisture out, well, our dry matter per acre was a little bit more, is 3.02 tons per acre. $62.96 was our cost per ton of dry matter, 12% on crude protein, 54.05 on TDN, and 103.5 on, on RFQ, which is relative forage quality. Uh, our control plot, remember we were talking, I talked about that just a minute ago, is common Bermuda and crabgrass predominantly. And we, we got 33,684 uh, pounds took the moisture off of it, that comes out to be 2.73 tons of dry matter. Our cost, which um, you, you, you can deduce very easily, was quite a bit less than our planted varieties because we didn't have seed costs. Uh, all we had was fertilizer costs on that was $33.09 per ton dry matter. And, and, and this cost per ton dry matter does include our baling costs. So it's fertilizer and baling on, uh, on the control as well. Crude protein, running 11.75%, TDN at 52.55, and RFQ of 95. So the take home message, I guess, uh, from, from my point of view, when we're talking about summer annuals and what we've done here and what we've seen, the best usage for summer annuals from what we've seen up here is if you have ground that is laying fallow, if you've got ground that's not already committed, that's not already planted, in a, in a hybrid Bermuda or another improved forage variety of another perennial forage variety, so to speak, uh, you may want to take a look at these summer annuals. But I do want to call attention to the fact of the cost per ton of dry matter. Um, it, it can be quite pricey to, to, to produce uh, these summer annuals. Uh, we, we, we did see, of course, you see a, a uh, kind of an increased yield and our total tons of dry matter is is better. Control Our control uh, plot was the poorest performing of the three, but our costs were very low, so to speak. And if you look over in the three, uh, three columns on the right, as far as our quality, our quality was not that much lower on our control versus what we saw 
uh, on our sorghum sudan grass and our pearl millet. So if you're needing that tonnage, and if you want to try to get just a little bit of bump in quality, and you got some ground that ordinarily would not be used for haying, then you may want to look into some sorghum sudan grass, pearl millet, or, or some of those others. If you have questions on that, uh, I, I, I flew over this very quickly, uh, kind of an in-depth thing we do, but I flew over it very quickly. Just please reach out to me, reach out to Ashley, and we'll uh, we, we'll get you headed in the right direction. I, I just want y'all to evaluate how you're putting up your hay and how you're making these decisions on your hay because I lot, see a lot of people that don't evaluate that. And so I'm going to close with that and and I'm going to say if, if you have any questions, you can ask Jason because he, he can answer them better than I can. <laughs> so with that, Ashley, I'm going to quit sharing. And I'm going to turn it back over to y'all. All right, thank you. So let's try this again. Jason, I think you can go ahead and share your screen. OK, it looks good on my end, so you should be able to go ahead and start whenever you're ready. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I uh, think that was an excellent uh, uh, run through in terms of being able to make some decisions on uh, on how you acquire or produce your hay. Uh, so as we move into the next section of this talk, we're going to get into more of the production um, of of hay or baleage. Well, as Lee mentioned, we will discuss uh, discuss baleage a little bit. Uh, but as, uh, as we get into this, uh, we're going to cover some uh, some basics in terms of uh, good management practices in terms of production of quality forages um, and with a focus on that hay production or that baleage production. So the first thing we're going to talk about is weed control. So we all know that broadleaf grasses, broadleaf, not broadleaf grasses, broadleaf weeds, I'm sorry, um, are heavy nitrogen feeders. Um, so we've got to make sure that we keep those those pests under control uh, prior to making any type of fertilizer applications. If we're if we're putting out fertilizer applications and we know that we've got some hefty populations of some of these broad leaves out there, our grasses are not going to be able to utilize a high percentage of that fertilizer. Um, um, some of that's going to go to feeding these broadleaf plants, which we're trying to prevent. So some of those that we're talking about winter broad leaves uh, like henbit, uh, geraniums, mouse ear, chickweed, curly dot, uh, buttercup, uh, all of those are examples of what we're talking about in terms of winter broad leaves. So all of those are the ones that we're seeing that are blooming right now. Um, those, uh, those plants actually germinated uh, during the winter months and they're flowering now. So um, uh, we're seeing all of the hen bits and the buttercups and you ride around right now, you see just fields of yellow with all of that's buttercup. So if we would have done a better job of, uh, of applying uh, some sort of herbicide or a herbicide earlier in the season, we would have been efficient at, uh, at controlling some of those plants. So I give you some examples there. So if white clover is present, one pint per acre of a 2,4-D product is a good control option uh, if we spray them early in the growing season. Uh, so uh, white clovers are fairly tolerant to 2,4-D products. Uh, your ball, your crimps and those may not be quite as uh, quite as forgiving with 2,4-D, uh, with but if we keep that around a pint per acre, uh, we should cause some minimal damage to those white clovers. So if no clover is present, one and a half pints to one quart per acre of a product containing 2,4-D and dicamba is a good option. Uh, we're going to look at some other ones that we use for summer broadleaf plants. It may also be an option for you. Uh, I just think those 2,4-D dicamba mixes are fairly good options in terms of control and also cost per acre. So some of those broadleaf plant examples would be pigweed. So you've got uh, red, wheat, red root pigweed, you got spiny pigweed. Uh, cypress weed, also known as dog fennel, uh, horse nettle, so some people may hear that called tread salve, um, bull thistle, so that's uh, that's the ones that you're seeing right now. I've got the big tall um, uh, uh, flower on them. Uh, biennial plant, so produces a rosette in year one, flowers in year two, a whole lot easier to control in that, uh, in that rosette stage. And then also goat weeds that we'll see later on in the summer months. So anytime that we control control these weeds early in the growth cycle, uh, we're going to do a better job of controlling our cost per acre because we don't have to use near as much chemical uh, controlling those weeds early in that growth cycle. 
Um, if there is clover in the fields, it's going to be difficult to control some of these harder to control or harder to kill summer broadleaf plants. Uh, there is an option on the horizon, so pro clover uh, is anticipated to have a registration sometime this year. Um, I looked this morning to see if it had been released and it, uh, it still says that they're awaiting registration, but they are anticipating that this year. So that'll be a pretty good option for those folks that do have legumes present in their fields, but they want to try to control some of these harder to, harder to kill broad leaves. Uh, if no clover is present, uh, products containing aminopyr lid uh, and 2,4-D or picloram and 2,4-D are good options. Uh, and there are some other options um, um, in 2,4-D sensitive areas. Uh, so just contact your local extension agent uh, for more information on some of those, those options. So just real quickly, uh, some good control tips or best management practices. Uh, calibrate your spray equipment. Uh, know what you're putting out. That's just good, smart business. It keeps you from uh, applying too little or too much chemical per acre. Check your nozzles. Make sure you don't have any nozzles stopped up. Check all your hoses. Make sure you don't have any leaks, your fittings. Check your pump. Yeah, all these pumps wear out uh, over time and use. So uh, to just make sure that uh, just because that uh, that calibration schedule that that manufacturer gives to you at time of purchase doesn't mean that it's going to maintain that for the next five to ten years. And you got to calibrate it to make sure uh, that everything is still functioning properly. Uh, so do that at a minimum annually, uh, ideally, ideally uh, periodically during the growing season. So correctly identify. I'll let that go by. Uh, correctly identify the weeds you're wanting to control. So uh, uh, it's important to understand the difference between a broadleaf, a grass, a sage, because we're going to use different type chemicals to control those different types of plants. Uh, utilize your local cooperative extension service if you need assistance in, uh, in proper identification. Uh, there's, uh, 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 there is one thing that uh, the use of smartphones has really changed our ability to get uh, uh, get really quick proper identification. If it's something that I can't identify or another extension agent cannot identify, uh, we've got specialists uh, that are just a text message away or an email away, and it has really changed the game in terms of us being able to provide that proper identification in a very, very timely manner. Uh, so follow the label directions for proper mixing application rates and timing and application. And just remember due diligence whenever weeds are stressed due to environmental conditions or when weeds have reached the end of their life cycle, i.e. mature, that's not the most cost effective time or cost efficient or efficient time to apply herbicide. Uh, so just that's just some quick control tips whenever we are utilizing uh, chemical control measures. So once we've done all that, we can start thinking about uh, applying some fertilizer uh, to increase the um, uh, the yield and the quality of the field that we're getting ready to cut. So Lee has mentioned this. If you read anything uh, uh, on the web right now about uh, about fertilizer prices, uh, fertilizer prices are high. Uh, specifically, anything containing a nitrogen source. Uh, so whenever nitrogen prices are high, we realize that folks cut back. Um, but what we what we're encouraging you to do is to to remember uh, that nitrogen does have a tremendous effect on forage yields. We're going to look in just a minute. It also has an effect on quality of that forage. So in order for you to to determine the amount of cutback that you're going to apply, if you are going to cut back, uh, so you need to evaluate your forage systems both summer and winter. Um, how much standing forage or stored hay do you need? Um, uh, so you you need to go back and and look at some of that scenario that, uh, that Lee provided earlier and determine how much hay do you need? Um, uh, how much more standing forage do you need? If you're way understocked, um, you may not need to apply as much nitrogen, but if you're overstocked, um, then that nitrogen application is going to be important to you to generate more dry matter or more standing forage. Develop a cost effective soil fertility program based on soil testing, and we're going to talk about that in a little more detail in just a minute. 
So I'm not going to go through this entire scenario with you in terms of determining um, uh, nutrient needs and cost of fertilizer on a pound per pound of nutrient basis, but I think it's important to provide the uh, the math in there for you. So I encourage you to take a look at that. All you have to do uh, is change up. Uh, uh, you can plug in the um, whatever you're paying for your nitrogen source. Uh, so and that, that may be specific to you. You may just want to generalize or average that out and then determine how many pounds of actual nitrogen you're going to be applying per acre. So uh, I used uh, $490 a ton for 4600 and figured that we were uh, just going to put out about 80 or 85 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So that kind of walk you through that math in terms of uh, in terms of what you need to uh, to do in terms of math for, for calculating that uh, that fertilizer on a, a per pound of nutrient basis. So as I said a while ago, that nitrogen fertilization does have an effect on Bermuda grass quality. Uh, so uh, the bottom of the graph is going to be your rates of in uh, in terms of pounds per acre. So we've got a control at zero, 100, 200, 300, and 400 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, so it's actual nitrogen. And then over on the left-hand side of the graph, we're showing uh, crew protein expressed as a percentage. The blue lines are uh, spring applications, and then as we get into the summer months, the red lines would be that summer month. So uh, if we look, uh, if I can get my pointer to come up here. So if we look uh, uh, in this 200 to 300 pounds per acre right here. Uh, so um, 200 pounds per acre may be a good uh, rate to consider on a um, on an annual growing basis for common Bermuda grass or Bahia grasses. Uh, and then as we get into those hybrid Bermudas, we're going to have to be over here in this three to four hundred pounds of N per acre. Uh, so uh, we can see that as we increase uh, uh, pounds of N per acre, uh, that we also increase in terms of crude protein expressed as a percentage. So uh, if we're considering that a, uh, a dry cow that may be in the first one third of lactation needs to be around 8% crude protein. So this line right here. Uh, so we know that uh, um, and we don't have to worry about if we're just going to be um, um, fooling with dry cows, um, um, we may not need to. Uh, we not, may not need to worry about a whole lot of fertilizer, fertilizer application on the forage that they're going to be eating as standing forage, or the uh, forage that they're going to be heating as as stored hay. Um, uh, but as we move into a um, stage of production in that cow's life where she is lactating, we need to be closer to this 11 to 12 percent crude protein line up here. Um, so we know that we're going to have to put out some crude or some some nitrogen fertilizer out there in order for us to be able to do that. Um, so if I can get it to advance. So the only way we uh, we're going to be able to determine um, fertilizer applications outside of nitrogen is with a soil test. Um, so different states may have uh, uh, different looks to their soil test results. So this is one from uh, the LSU Ag Center Soil Lab on campus in Baton Rouge. So our nitrogen um, rates are going to be determined by type of forage um, and um, research. Um, drew a blank there. So type of forage and just research information in terms of how much uh, Bermuda, how much uh, nitrogen that we need to apply uh, in this example to Bermuda grass. So uh, we've got Bermuda grass down here at the bottom. So a hybrid Bermuda. So that's where I said a while ago we need those nitrogen rates to be up there three to four hundred pounds of N per acre. Uh, but if we get down here to establish common Bermuda grass, uh, we just need to be somewhere in that 80 to 120 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. So 
We're using research information and type of forage to determine nitrogen applications. However, we need soil test results in order to determine phosphorus and potassium. Uh, so um, those will be expressed over here again as pounds of nutrient per acre. Um, so anytime you need help um, uh, interpreting those results, please reach out to us. Uh, we will be more than happy to, uh, to work with you uh, in evaluating um, your soil test results and what you need to do uh, on your, your specific site. So just real quick, uh, anytime you see a very low rating, uh, you would expect less than 50% crop potential with no added nutrient, all the way up to a high to very high, which is no added nutrient is required. So everything that that particular plant species needs is being uh, provided with no additional fertilizer uh, application. So the major nutrients that we're talking about, N, P, and K, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So remember on any bag of fertilizer, uh, the first number is always nitrogen, the second number is always phosphorus, the third number is always potassium. So I put in there next to potassium. So K is linked to Bermuda grass decline. So if you'll, uh, if you see right here, this is a snip that I took out of one of our uh, experiment station bulletins. So you see a, a zero rate all the way up to a 400 uh, pounds of actual potassium per acre rate. Um, you can see what it does to hay yields. And then this is these last two columns are uh, Bermuda grass stand expressed as a percentage. Uh, so on year one, if we do no potassium applications, we had a 57% stand. On year six, again, no potassium application, we got a 29% stand. So um, if we get down here to 200, that's a pretty common number I see uh, with a lot of the soil sample results that I get back here. Um, uh, if, we, if we do that on year one, we see that we can get an increase in stand in terms of a percentage uh, just by making those potassium applications. A lot of times I think we get guilty uh, of just uh, um, just applying a nitrogen source, uh, and we don't uh, we don't really do a good job of getting out there doing some soil sampling, and um, and figuring out what we need in terms of if we need any phosphorus applications. Uh, the area of the state that Lee and I work in, uh, there's a lot of broiler litter that goes out. So most of our fields that have had a good bit of broiler litter applied to them over the years don't require any phosphorus applications. Uh, but uh, um, uh, they do they do certainly require some some potassium applications um, over time. All right, so liming um, uh, that's something that uh, that over time, especially in some of these highly erodible soils, um, uh, very fine sandy soils that we've got around here. Uh, lime has to be applied over time um, and we uh, we leach that off. Um, we also use uh, acid forming fertilizers that uh, that will decrease the pH of the soil. Uh, so liming does become important to us. So the reason that we um, we want to consider uh, what the pH of our soil is is because it basically as the slide says it basically makes fertilizer work. So ideally for most Louisiana forages, and I know that's a general comment, but most Louisiana forage crops do best at a 5.5 five to a 6.5. So if we're trying to be somewhere in this area right here, um, let's say that we're going to be around a 6, um, we can see what that does in terms of our plant availability of those nutrients whenever uh, our pH is correct. Um, uh, a pH of seven is uh, is not practical. Uh, we're not trying to lime to a pH of seven. We're trying to lime to a pH on most of our uh, most of our forage crops in Louisiana, uh, somewhere between a five five uh, and a six five. So approximate nutrient removal from hay production. So as uh, as Lee said a while ago, uh, early on we do remove nutrients from. Uh, from the fields whenever we cut hay. So in a 100% in a grazing situation, we get nutrient recycling through the manure and the urine. Uh, 
Uh, so as those grazers consume those forages above the ground, uh, they recycle those nutrients because you don't find a lot of these type nutrients, the nitrogen, phosphate, potash. You don't find a lot of those nutrients that uh, in the digestive system of the ruminant animals. So they're recycling that through the urine and through the manure. But in a haying situation where we're removing that plant canopy uh, from the field, we're taking it completely off, uh, we know that there's going to be some nutrient removal uh, per ton of that hay produced. So uh, I'm giving you two columns here, one for a hybrid Bermuda grass, one for a Bahia grass, uh, in terms of the pounds of nutrient removed per ton of hay produced. So uh, because of the, uh, the charge of phosphate, um, uh, it binds to the soil molecules. So uh, we don't get a lot of leaching of phosphate. Uh, but these other nutrients, we certainly do get a good bit of leaching um, uh, through that uh, through that uh, uh, that hay production. Uh, you can see that that potash. Uh, it's the reason that uh, in a haying situation, um, uh, we've got to go back in there and apply uh, some potash. We've got to apply some nitrogen. Uh, I don't discuss sulfur a whole lot in this presentation, but. Uh, on your sulfur sample results, you will get a, a sulfur uh, level and uh, sulfur is also uh, relative to uh, a little bit of uh, stand decline. Uh, so pay attention to that. So used to uh, before um, a lot of our, our meals were the, they started scrubbing the air coming out of those meals, we would get sulfur just about every time it rained. Uh, but now uh, that uh, a lot of that air coming out of those meals or all of that air coming out of our meals now is scrub for air quality. Uh, we don't get a mu as much as that sulfur now uh, each time that it rains. So a few tips for making high quality hay. Um, and these are just the ones that I could get on a slide. I mean, we could debate about other ones that may be available to you out there, but I think these are the ones that we've certainly got to uh, got to address. Uh, uh, first and foremost, if we do want to make, again, this high quality hay. All right. Uh, so anybody can go out there and they can uh, they can bail up uh, whatever they have available to them. But if we want to increase the nutritional quality of that product, we've got to put some inputs into it. So uh, we'll look at a slide in just a few minutes that Dr. Week Allison sent to me about incorporating legumes or annual grasses into the forage system. Uh, but anytime we know that we do that, uh, we will improve the overall nutritional quality of that forage. Um, it's just like if you go back to one of those, the chart that Lee showed about the uh, the control in that uh, that project they looked at with the summer annuals. So the control was crabgrass mixed in with some Bermuda grass. Well, crabgrass, we can go out there and scratch the ground in some of these fields that we've got around here, and we're going to get some crabgrass growth. Crabgrass growth. Um, and so anytime that we can, uh, uh, we can, we can add that into a forage system, um, those annual plants like crabgrass, we know that we can improve that quality. So as we saw in the chart while ago, addition of nitrogen fertilized will improve nutritive value of forages. Um, however, forage maturity at harvest is the number one effect, factor affecting quality. So, um, I think uh, uh, a lot of folks get hung up on how much overall quantity they put up. Uh, they don't want to go out there and run a bunch of equipment and spend a bunch of money and fuel uh, to produce uh, very uh, only one or two bales per acre. They want to go out there and they want to be able to put up three bales per acre. Um, and, and you might be able to do that, but you're going to be in order as you as you get further into maturity of the grass, uh, the fiber components uh, like lignin uh, build up in that plant. Uh, so as the as the fiber components and the lignin um, uh, increases in that plant, digestibility uh, or the ability of that animal to degrade that forage and that fermentation system in the ruminant animal. Um, uh, becomes less efficient. Uh, so uh, as we as we are unable to get highly digestible forages into the ruminant animal, 
we know that the nutritional quality that that animal is going to get from that particular forage is going to decline. So we have got to manage forage maturity. Uh, so a good rule of thumb on a Bermuda grass field to be cut for hay uh, every 35 to 45 days to achieve optimal nutritional values and still get the yields that we need to make it worth our time to go across the field. So on the high end of that, try not to get more than about six weeks of elapsed time between cuts. Um, once we, we'll look at a chart in just a second, that uh, uh, once we get out past that six week time frame, uh, we really start seeing that nutritive value just start taking a nosedive. We'll to approximately 11 to 15 percent moisture. So I, uh, I think a lot of folks try to get that uh, that dry, that high hay just as dry as they can get it uh, for fear of uh, putting it into the barn too hot. But we can wilt it down to 11 to 15 percent moisture and not be in danger of uh, building up too much heat in that if we're storing it in a barn. Um, and so if, if you need help with trying to determine that, I've got a forage dryer, Lee's got a forage dryer, we can help you with that in terms of just trying to help educate you a little bit in terms of what that 11 to 15 percent looks and feels like. So the reason we're trying not to just over dry it is because whenever we rake that forage up into a windrow uh, or we're, uh, we're running a fluffer through it, we're beating the leaves off of it. And then all we've got is just a stemmy product. So if we leave about 11 to 15 percent of that moisture in that plant through a wilting process, uh, we're not going to lose as much leaf off of that uh, off of that plant through the uh, uh, through the fluffing or the raking process. So we want to cover it if at all possible. Um, and I know that is not going to be possible for everybody, but if at all possible, we need to cover it. So barn tarps work well. If no cover is available, stack it in rows at least three foot apart in the open. Um, and you want to leave some airflow in between the rows. So we're not wanting to stack the rows directly up next to each other. We need a little bit of airflow uh, going through them so these rows can dry out a little bit if, as we get rainfall on them. Um, need to be on a very well-drained slope. We don't need to put them somewhere where they're going to hold water. Uh, the more water they hold in the areas where we put them outside, uh, the more losses we're going to get in terms of quantity and quality. Uh, crushed rock works well as a bed. If we're going to be storing them outside uncovered, put them on a crushed rock bed or other easily drained substance. Um, and just remember that stored losses, storage losses can easily exceed 25% uh, whenever we do store those uh, those stored forages, those hay products in a poorly um, poorly drained area or poorly stored area. So this is the chart I was talking about in terms of frequency, harvest frequency effect on Bermuda grass quality. Uh, so the uh, the bottom of the chart down here shows the weeks between harvests. Um, uh, curry protein over on the left side. Uh, so you can see that we start getting uh, a decrease in crude protein as we move out there uh, past six weeks. And this is the effects on total digestible nutrients or TDN expressed as a percentage. Uh, so again, if we go back to this one, if we're talking about a dry cow um, uh, or, or a early gestation cow needing about 8% crude protein, we might be able to do fine with this out here. Uh, but that, that um, that lactating cow in milk, if we got to be out there and that uh, that 11 to 12 percent crude protein, then we've got to be in this range right here uh, in order to produce a crude protein product um, uh, in our hay that's going to be uh, well utilized or efficiently utilized by that lactating cow. So again, TDN, so that uh, that gestating cow, uh, 53, 52 to 54 percent. Uh, TDN, uh, so we're way up here. Uh, lactating cow, 59%, um, 58 to 60 if you want to give it a range in terms of TDN. So uh, anytime that I visit with folks, and a lot of times the haze that I see of folks that are doing forage testing, they're really trying to do the right thing. They're, they're fertilizing correctly. They're soil sampling. Protein is not the 
the limiting factor that I see a lot of. Uh, it's TDN. It's the energy and value in that forage that we're feeding um, that we need to be supplementing during, uh, during those feeding periods. All right, so moving into baleage. So everything we talked about so far has been dry hay um, um, or low moisture hay. So we're going to move into baleage now, which we're talking about high moisture. Uh, so in recent years, there has been a considerable interest from beef cattle producers uh, in using baled silage or AKA baleage uh, to reduce those feeding expenses. Uh, so in mine and Lee's part of the world, um, we've had no choice to become versed in this. Uh, I know a lot of folks that have been doing it for, for many years, uh, whenever the dairy industry was very large around here. We had a lot of folks that, uh, a lot of those dairy producers that, uh, that utilize this technology in the, in the large dairy producing countries of the United States, they still have never stopped using this technology. Uh, but it's uh, around here in North Louisiana, uh, the uh, uh, the rise in, in popularity with beef cattle producers has has really taken hold, and um, and we've just had really no choice but to become versed in it, and really get out there and learn as much about this uh, this practice as we can. Uh, so baleage is produced by baling high moisture forage, so typically 45 to 60 percent moisture, uh, wrapping the bales in plastic to exclude oxygen, and allow the forage to ferment or insol. Um, uh, conserving forage as baleage uh, reduces the risk of field curing, harvest and storage losses as we look at some of these advantages and disadvantages in just a second. Uh, helps retain that nutritive value uh, so we don't lose as much of that nutritive value in that storage process. Um, improves palatability of the forage as compared to conventional dry hay. Um, uh, and it just really in my mind, it's a game changer for those folks that uh, they've got enough they've got enough cows in the herd to spread the cost out, uh, and that's what I think it all boils down to um, is having enough cows in the herd to spread out the additional cost. So advantages, um, um, so we decrease in baleage waste down to about eight to ten percent, depending on how you feed it. Uh, so uh, if we unroll that hay bale. Uh, whenever we feed it, uh, we can be 8% or less. Uh, but if we're just still stacking it out there in a, uh, in a cone feeder or a bale feeder, um, uh, we, uh, we're going to be increasing that wastage. Uh, compared to a dry bale uh, of hay wastage, 17 to 25% um, from the harvesting, storage, and feeding uh, of that particular product. Uh, so lower field losses. Uh, lower storage losses, uh, timely harvesting. So um, in our news update yesterday uh, that got released this morning, uh, Lee and I were talking about the amount of rain and these cold fronts that just keep uh, keep passing through. Uh, Vince down in central Louisiana was talking about how wet it was down there. So uh, we're in the season right now to where we've got cool season annuals, aka ryegrass, uh, that's ready to be taken off of these fields. So if we don't have, if we're going to dry that, if we're going to wilt that forage down to 11 to 15 percent moisture, we need several days, four days, uh, uh, depending on what direction the wind's out of, depending on how much sunshine we get, um, and it could take some time to get that ryegrass, that high moisture ryegrass wilted down to 11 to 15 percent. So through baleage, we're able to put that up at 45 to 65 percent moisture. Uh, so we're able to um, mitigate Mother Nature a little bit in terms of being able to put up a high quality ryegrass product. So increased consumption, uh, lower feeding losses. So uh, it's a it's a very palatable product. Um, uh, cattle just seem to uh, to like to eat it a little bit better if it's put upright uh, and it's a good quality product. Uh, so we have lower feeding losses uh, as we put that out. So disadvantages, Lee talked in detail about equipment costs. Um, the equipment costs uh, go up exponentially with, uh, with this practice. Uh, so additional tractors, you got to have a wrapper, um, maybe uh, a different baler. 
uh, possibly bail movers. So if you don't have bail movers, you got to have uh, additional trailers, possibly additional trucks pulling trailers, uh, moving it to where you're wrapping it if you're doing it in line. Um, uh, if you're going to be wrapping individually in the field, you still got to be able to move those bales out of the field in an efficient manner. Uh, so you're going to have plastic costs, increased labor, uh, plastic disposal. What are you going to do with that? So wildlife damage, that's a big one that's around here. So the coyotes like digging into it, the buzzards like digging into it. Um, everywhere that they dig into that plastic, you need to get that take back up in a very timely manner. Uh, everywhere the oxygen is allowed to uh, get back into that bag, um, you're going to have um, um, that product is going to be uh, going to be ruined. Uh, so it's not going to it's not going to insile. And then just basic insiling failures due to uh, is the moisture too high? Is the moisture too low? Uh, did we not do a good job of excluding oxygen, aka did we not put enough stretch film on it? Um, uh, whatever the reason may be in terms of those those insiling failures. So this is just a quick video and I'm not going to play all of this video, but uh, just a quick video to uh, to show you um, if I can get this to play. Just to show you what we're talking about in terms, this is an inline baling process or baleage process with some ryegrass forage. So I encourage you if you uh, if you want to learn more about that uh, uh, before you uh, uh, before anybody uh, pulls the trigger on anything, I think it's important to do your homework. But if you want to learn more about that process, reach out to us. Uh, uh, we'll be glad to uh, to provide the information to you. Um, now is a good time to see this practice being uh, uh, being utilized across North Louisiana, across South Louisiana, for that fact. I know a lot of folks in South Louisiana that utilize this technology. Um, uh, so now is a good time to get out there and, and see it uh, taking place with all of these uh, these cool season annuals coming off. Um, so for those folks that uh, that are doing it right now, here's a few tips that are uh, that I think are important for making that high quality baleage. Again, uh, the incorporation of annual grasses or legumes. Uh, Y'all stage of maturity is just as important in this process as it is in putting up a dry bale of hay. Um, uh, early boot stage for grasses like ryegrass, if you've got some clovers in there, bud to 10% bloom uh, for those legumes. Uh, so for ryegrass baleage, um, if, you, uh, if you're clipping it off or grazing it uh, to three to four inches, uh, so uh, a lot of times we can get an additional um, uh, utilization of that. So uh, if we if we if we clip it off in terms of uh, cutting it for hay and we want to try to get a second cutting, which we can do with those rye grasses, uh, we don't want to cut it right down on the ground. So cut it at about three to four inches, uh, put out about 50 to 70 units of nitrogen per acre and that'll help push that second crop um, uh, or utilize it as grazing. So graze it down uh, let those cows utilize some of it. Um, uh, it's a very high quality grazing forage. Graze it down to about three or four inches, put out some nitrogen, uh, and that'll help you uh, in terms of getting some adequate forage out there, uh, dry matter uh, to put up in a baleage product. 
Uh, wilt the forage uh, down to about 50% moisture, plus or minus 10%. Uh, if you're feeding it to weaned calves, so uh, some of uh, the producers I work with prefer that that moisture content be closer to 40%. Um, uh, some of them will get it down to about 35% if they're feeding it to those weaned calves. Those weaned calves will start uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that lower moisture forage uh, better than they will on that high moisture forage. I'm not saying they won't eat it. I'm just saying they'll start on it better. Um, so that might be an option for you. you know, the goal is to form the highest density bale that you can make. I cannot stress enough how important bale density is in this product. The tightness of the bale from the core all the way out to the outside of the bale is extremely important. It needs to be dense. Um, we are trying to exclude oxygen in this process. So if we've got a bunch of voids in a lightly, in a low density bale, lightly wrapped, low density bale, we're going to have a lot of oxygen in this that's in there. Um, um, so the, the tighter the bale, the more dense the bale, uh, the better product we're going to make in terms of an inside product. Uh, wrap in minimum six to eight layers of stretch film. Uh, this needs to be done within two hours of baling. So um, the higher the moisture, uh, we may be able to get away with six layers of stretch film, the drier. So if we're getting down there on that 35, 30% moisture, uh, we're probably going to need to be up there about eight layers of stretch film to make sure that we're excluding oxygen. So we're going to let it sit a minimum of 45 days, preferably out there about 60 days prior to feeding it. Uh, to allow that fermentation process to take place. Um, and this is uh, this is something that I tell folks all the time whenever they talk to me about it. There is absolutely nothing miraculous that takes place underneath the cover of that white plastic. If you put junk into it, you'll have inside junk on the other side. Um, there's nothing miraculous that's going to improve the, the nutritional quality of that product. We still have to be good managers in terms of when we uh, when we harvest in uh, the process that goes into that product up until the time we get it wrapped. So making sure that we're we're wrapping it within two hours, no more than four hours. Make sure that we're not cutting corners on how much stretch film we're putting on it. Uh, making sure that we're doing due diligence in terms of learning moisture content. For Folks have been putting up dry hay for years, but a lot of our beef cattlemen may not be familiar enough with these higher, higher moisture forages in order to uh, to be very good at, uh, at estimating that. So um, uh, utilizing forage dryers like I talked about a while ago uh, to help us do that. So these are some numbers real quick that, uh, that Dr. Wink Allison sent to me. Um, uh, I told you that I would talk a little bit about uh, incorporating legumes into grasses. Uh, so over on the right side of this chart is our grasses. The grasses being mainly um, annual uh, rye grasses. Uh, over on the far right hand side, that grass legume is going to be some warm season perennial Bermuda grass, along with some annual rye grass, along with the legumes. Uh, the grass legume mix that's on the uh, more towards the center, that's going to be all annual rye grasses and, uh, and white clover. Um, as you get over on the right hand side, that legume is going to be some ball clover uh, later in the season. So I think this is just a really good, uh, a really good chart to show you that we what we can do with nutritional quality whenever we diversify our forages a little bit in terms of incorporating uh, legumes into those grasses. Uh, if we want to get that uh, uh, that relative feed quality um, uh, up where we need it to be. So a few closing comments, uh, soil test, soil test, soil test, fertilize based on that soil test, uh, harvest at the correct stage of maturity. Remember that is the number one way uh, that we can manage uh, nutritional quality of the forage is to manage maturity. Uh, control weeds and other pests. We didn't get into some of the other pests that are out there that attack some of these these forage crops, but we've got to manage them. Uh, proper wilting and handling. If we're putting up dry hay, we don't want to just dry, <coughs> excuse me, dry it out so much that uh, that we're beating all the leaves off of it. 
uh, as we go through the, uh, the raking process, uh, how we handle it, um, how we store it. And y'all, I cannot stress to you enough the importance of doing forage testing. It helps you be more efficient in who, uh, uh, what group of cattle you're feeding those forages to. Uh, if you've got some lower nutritional and you've got a group of uh, dry cows out there, you can divert that lower nutritional hay towards them. If you know you've got some higher nutritional value hay or baleage, you can divert that towards those cows that are lactating. And with that, Ashley, I may have gone a little bit long. It looks like I did go a little long. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, sir. If you don't mind, if you'll stop sharing, I'm going to put our um, link to our survey up. Let me see. Okay, so hopefully you all can all see that. Um, if you don't mind, take just, I mean, it's two to three minutes um, to to complete our survey for this webinar. It also gives you a chance to tell us what topics you'd like to hear for, from us in the future. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, the first is you can open the camera on your phone, uh, view this little QR code on the right. It'll pop up a banner at the top of your phone. You can click that and it'll take you directly to the survey. The second way is I will also have a link to the survey in the video and podcast description for this particular webinar. Um, so again, we, we greatly appreciate your feedback for that. It helps us in our programming efforts. Um, with that, thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you, Lee and Jason, both for the time um, that you spent to put this together and to present it for us this morning. I know it's a, a much needed and very timely topic. If y'all have any questions um, for Lee or Jason, my information is always in the descriptions for this. You can reach out to us. Um, that way I can forward it to them. And then if you have any questions regarding the series, the Beef Brunch Educational Series, uh, you can visit our website. Um, you can find all of our past videos on our YouTube channel that you can see here on the screen. And um, just a reminder, Jason mentioned our news updates. We do have biweekly news updates that go out with this as well. So any questions you have for the series, you can send them our way. Um, and outside of that, uh, thank you all again for joining us this morning, and we will be back with you next month.